Hey, it's Jim, and this is level one of the CFA program, the topic on corporate issuers and the learning module on working capital and liquidity. We've recently had some good conversations on the financial statements. Our focus here is on the balance sheet. In particular, we're going to look at the top left hand side of the balance sheet and the top right hand side of the balance sheet. And essentially, we're going to try to make a determination on the quality of the liquidity facing a business. Now we're going to hear words like liquidity and cash conversion cycle, managing working capital. But essentially, these LOSs could be wrapped up in, in one word, and that word is solvency. We're trying to determine how does the firm manage this concept of the ability to meet short-term obligations. That's our definition of insolvency. So let's get right to this cash conversion cycle. Notice that we have down at the bottom of the slide uh, what looks like a circle, right? This cash conversion cycle. And so what we're doing here is we're starting with cash. And let's not worry too much about where we, uh, where we came up with that cash. I mean, we could have issued a bond, we could have issued shares of stock, but it's more likely that this is cash that's left over from operations during a previous time period. We'll talk a little bit more about that as the, as the slide deck progresses. But we start with cash and what do we do? Well, we make a bunch of purchases. Whatever kind of a business we are, uh, let's take an example like General Mills. General Mills makes lots and lots of stuff that we eat. My favorite product line in all of the General Mills universe is Count Chocula. I used to eat an entire box of Count Chocula when I was a little dude and my mother used to shake her finger at me and say, oh, Jimmy, how could you do that? So if we're General Mills, we need to purchase these raw materials. What kind of raw materials are there? Well, sugar and then, and then according to my mother, even more sugar. And then let's pile some more sugar into Count Chocula. But flour and dough and cocoa and whatever else goes in there. They had to buy cardboard for the box and they had to buy paper for the inner lining and then they had to buy cellophane to put them in a box and then put them on a pallet, right? So you have all these purchases of raw materials and then you put them on the conveyor belt and at the end of the conveyor belt shows up this box of Count Chocula. So then we start selling them to Walmart and Target and the food stores uh, throughout the country. And what we could do is we could say something like, look, if you buy my boxes of Count Chocula, you have to pay me cash. But that's pretty much not the way life works in the business world. You guys know this. So we'll say something like, look, here's, here's a million dollars worth of Count Chocula. Pay me, pay me next week or pay me in two weeks or pay me next month, next month. So we extend credit to do all uh, to facilitate uh, this transaction, which means we are incurring an accounts receivable. And then we need to worry about collecting that cash. So this cash conversion cycle, just think of uh, think of uh, Count Chocula and I'll bet you'd be able to uh, answer the question on the exam. Now let's talk about this operating cycle, which is a part of this cash cycle that we talked about on that previous slide. But the thing about it is, here, let me go back here just quickly. It kind of looks like, you know, we start with cash and we go to raw materials and we go down to the green, and we go to the purple. It kind of looks like this is a chronology, but of course we're buying sugar and we're making Count Chocula and we're selling Count Chocula. You know, we can do this all in the same day. All right. So, so in this cash conversion cycle, inside of it is this operating cycle that includes cash inflows and cash outflows that are probably occurring. Well, what does the slide tell us there? Uh, that they're occurring at different times. I'm going to go ahead and say they're occurring simultaneously. And so you got to think about this. What is the management of the ability of the firm to meet its short term obligations? Well, ideally, every time we had a cash outflow, we would have a cash inflow to offset that. And we could just take from one hand and throw it out to the other hand. But of course, of course, this isn't the way that it works in reality. I mean, sometimes, sometimes, I mean, think about this. We have a truckload of Count Chocula and the truck breaks down. So we're on the side of the highway and we're there for, I don't know, 12 hours or 24 hours or a week until we can get that truck 
repaired so that we can deliver it to Walmart or Target. You know, so this is not perfect. This is, this is all called un, the uncertainty of this cash conversion cycle. All right, let's go through a couple of these uh, balance sheet items. What did I say a few moments ago? Top left of the balance sheet, top right. So let's start with the top left here. Accounts receivable. So what are we doing? We're just extending credit, which means that we need to have somebody on our uh, on our executive leadership team to manage and organize an, uh, a group of individuals who can go out and collect that money. So it's one thing to go ahead and extend credit but it's a different kind of a part of this process to actually collect the cash. Then we have the inventory. Think of that as the, uh, as the boxes of Count Chocula. And uh, sooner, or, sooner or later, that inventory gets derecognized or it gets translated over to some other financial statement. We'll talk about the accounting of that in, uh, in, in a later learning module. Flipping over to the right hand top portion of the balance sheet, we have all these accounts payable. So of course we owe the farmers for the wheat, we owe the farmers for the corn, we owe the farmers for the sugar, and uh, they're going to extend credit to us as well. So we have extending credit on this side, we have extending credit on this side. So what we wanna do is we want to pay our bills as late as possible and we want to receive our cash as early as possible. But remember that every business is out there doing this. So this is not an easy task. Now look down at the bottom, we have this concept of an activity ratio. So I want you to think about this days of inventory on hand. So think about the finished box of Count Chocula, either sitting on a pallet or on a truck or in transport. You know, there's our inventory, then it gets to Walmart or Target and it's sitting on the shelf. All right, so days of inventory on hand. And then days payable outstanding and days sales outstanding. This is what the relationship between essentially what goes on in the balance sheet and then what could be happening over on the income statement. So there's probably gonna be a question on the exam for us to go ahead and compute this thing about the cash conversion cycle. In other words, what is the time frame from, let me just go back here real quickly. What is the time frame from where we start in cash in the red box until we receive that cash back in the red box as a return on our, uh, return on our short term investment? You know, what do we want to do? We want to do all this as quickly as possible to, to generate lots and lots of cash. All right, so here's a good equation. So we'll start with this days of inventory on hand. We'll add the days sales outstanding, and then we'll go ahead and subtract the days payable outstanding. So we have an example here in just a second. Here's another slide that gives us, you know, kind of a chronology. And once again, you know, those, the, uh, the learning module emphasizes the simple fact that these things can occur at different times. So it kind of looks like, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, but it doesn't have to be that way. But to understand this idea of the cash conversion cycle, I think it's beneficial to look at this as if it were an actual chronology. Now we can have, uh, we can have short conversion cycles and we can have long conversion cycles. Um, what that means is that there are implications for how we're going to manage this liquidity. How are we going to manage working capital? How are we going to manage the cash inflows and the cash outflows? And so you think about it, if, if those to whom we have extended credit, if they're not paying us when we think they should pay us, that means that we have less and less cash coming into the business, but we still have people over here on the other side of the supply chain that we owe money to, and they're knocking on our door saying something like, hey, you know what, or where's our money? And we can't say, we can't say, oh, hold on, I'll let you have your money whenever these people over here pay me. Because remember, this is, uh, you know, these contracts, these are legal and binding documents. 
All right, so notice the second arrow point there. A short or even negative cash conversion cycle is preferred. This is what I was saying earlier. We want, you know, we want the cash coming in faster than the cash going out. All right, how do we shorten the cash conversion cycle? This is a great question here. Reduce the inventory on hand, reduce the day's sale, uh, sales outstanding, and the increase the day's payable. So if you, go back to, if you go back to this equation that we have right here, what we want to do is extend that time period when it benefits us, and we want to shrink that time period when it hurts us so that we can manage these cash cycles in a more efficient manner. So I think some of the good questions on the exam would be the bullet point points here. Uh, you know, I can envision a question stem where the institute said, hey, here's a business who's trying to reduce inventory or reduce the day's sales outstanding or increase the payable outstanding. Which of the following, which of the following decisions would be appropriate or would achieve that kind of a goal? And there you have them on the, on the block points there. And those are kinds of uh, obvious notions. I will caution you that some of these are are much more effective than some others. Like look down on number two, imposing late fees. I mean, this sounds like a great deal, um, but I always think about these late fees as kind of analogous to the whole conversation that we're gonna have in our economics days when we talk about tariffs and quotas and all those things when we have international trade. What you, what you don't wanna do is start imposing tremendous late fees on uh, the one side of the supply chain because then, you know, right, we're going to upset those people. Remember, didn't we just have a conversation on stakeholder theory? So those people on both sides of our supply chain, those are stakeholders. They have an interest in our business doing well. And so some of these things are more efficient than others. I like the second block point up under number one. You know, there has been tons and tons of professional and academic research to have this just-in-time inventory level. It's, it's an optimal inventory level. So, you know, as soon as that box account chocula comes off of the conveyor belt, we put it on a truck, we get it to Walmart in 10 minutes. And then someone like me comes by with my mother shopping and says, hey, mom, I'm out of count chocula. You know, that's that idea of shortening the cash conversion cycle. Now, one of the cool things uh, about this working capital and cash conversion cycle management is that sometimes we're going to extend credit and we're going to receive credit, but then there'll be an offer. Uh, it, it's kind of like you, those of you who make your property tax payments. I, I just made my school property tax payment and I paid the discount because it was, I don't know, $200 if I paid it by a certain time period. And then if I didn't, it was not due for several months. So it's always beneficial to go ahead and take advantage of that, of that discount. But then the question is, suppose that you don't have the money to make the payment on that early discounted payment. So then you have to ask yourself the question, all right, what about if we go to the bank and say, all right, Mr. or Mrs. Banker, can you lend us this capital now so that we can take advantage of this discount? What did I just say? I said the taking advantage of the discount is, I think I might have said always. How about if I couch that and say it's almost always, almost always beneficial. So here's a good example. Um, suppose the terms are uh, 30, 10 and net 30. So what that means is that um, we would have to pay in 30 days, right? So there's the extension of credit, pay us in 30 days, but but we can offer or we could be offered a discount of 3% if we pay this in 10 day window. All right, so essentially, essentially what you're gonna do is you're not gonna pay it today, right? You're gonna either pay it on day 10 or you're gonna pay it on day 30. If of course this is something that we owe. Well, the idea is that, well, suppose that we don't have this discounted amount at the end of day 10, can we go ahead and borrow from somebody else, like, like a banker? Now, of course, the banker is gonna charge us an interest rate and 
what the reading does, and we have it in, uh, we have it in bolded there. Look at that. What is that? The, the third arrow point, a low interest rate. So we're assuming that since this is going to be a short term loan, that it will be a low interest rate. You know, interest rates don't have to be low in the short term or the long term. In fact, they can be uh, uh, they can be super high. But we'll go ahead and listen to the author of this particular learning module and just assume that banks can do this at a low interest rate. So essentially what's happening is that every day that we don't make that payment to one of our suppliers, that we're taking out a loan, right? We don't pay them today. That means that we have that cash available today. We could do something else with it. And every day, day two and day five and 10 and 20 and 28 and 29. So that's kind of a loan. It's an Im implicit loan. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what is, what is the effective annual rate and we did this back at the very beginning of our level one conversations. In fact, I might think it might even have been that uh, that very first learning module where we took some interest rates that were annual and that were semi-annual and we converted them and we did this uh, effective annual rate. So this equation down there at the bottom shouldn't be uh, a surprise to you. And I'll show you an example here in just a second about how easy this is. So the question is, Maybe we should borrow from the bank and pay the supplier early. Are you ready for this? Even if we don't have the cash today. Now the question then becomes, what if we have the cash today? Should we take out a bank loan? Well, that's not part of this LOS. That's part of marginal cost, marginal benefit. And we'll have that conversation some, some other day. All right, so let's do a quick example here. We have terms of trade. Um, two, 10 and a net 30. So we could have a, we could, make a 2% discount if we pay within 10 days, but then the full balance is owed after 30 days. But then the local bank is offering an annual rate of 10%. Well, that doesn't sound like a low interest rate to me. Um, is this a prudent move by the company? Well, let me just go back quickly. We're going to use this. Uh, we're going to use this equation to come up with this, you know, kind of implicitly borrowing from the supplier. And so this is really simple math here. So we'll just do the 2% in the numerator. 365 days in a year, 30 minus 10. So that's day 10 all the way out to day 30. So that's 20 days. So we'll chop the year into increments of 20 day periods. And so this is essentially just like I taught you back in that first learning module. This is an F over P minus one, future value over present value minus one. And now it works that way with interest rates. So it's not a dollar amount in the numerator and the denominator like I taught you before. And so this is, well, what is that? It's almost 50%, right? So uh, uh, we might as well borrow the money from the bank at 10%. That makes perfect sense. Now, this, this formula here, you know, I was trying to convince you that this is similar to what we did, but I want to give you a different kind of a math take on this. So let's suppose that we owe... Uh, this business $100. And so what we can do is we can pay, we can pay within 10 days, we get a 2% discount. So that's $98. So what are we going to do? We're going to wait until day 10. And then we're going to go to the bank and we're going to borrow, we're going to borrow $98 from the bank and pay off the supplier, right? So then we're taking out a 20 day loan from the bank at 10%. Now, if you take uh, 0.1 and divide that by some n, you know, however many times 20 goes into 365, if you do all that and you get some kind of a time value of money factor, you're going to end up, now it depends on whether you do this with 20 days, maybe you do it monthly, um, but you're going to end up paying the bank less than $99. I did the math before I, did, I worked on the... Uh, I started this slide deck and the math comes out to be like $98 and 60 cents. If you do it over that 20 day period, if you do it monthly, it turns out to be like $98 and I can't remember 80 cents or something like that. So think about what's happening here. You take out the bank loan and you get, you only have to pay 90, well, what did I say? $98 and 80 cents or something like that for something that's worth a hundred, right? You're willing to pay a hundred for this. And now you only have to pay 9880 in in 30 days. But instead of paying your supplier, you're paying you're paying the banker. So I think if you do it that way, that brings the dollar amounts might make it a little bit more intuitive. Nevertheless, this is another good formula for you to memorize for the exam.
All right, I've used the term working capital a handful of times here. Let's go ahead and define working capital here. This is super simple. All we're going to do is take the top left of the balance sheet and subtract the top right of the balance sheet. So current assets minus current liabilities. This is the broadest and the most complete definition of working capital. But as you can imagine, um, these businesses, they have kind of their own ways of determining working capital, which is unique to their business. I mean, of course, General Mills probably has its own working capital formulation for Count Chocula, and then it might have a different, but extremely similar to a formulation for total working capital for, for their other product lines. Now, this brings us to the concept of a net working capital. So working capital back here, this includes everything, right? So look in the two white boxes there. That's everything at the top right and left of the balance sheet. But some, some of these accounts really don't have a whole lot to do with the cash conversion cycle or even some of its business operations. So what we're doing is networking capital. Well, it's still current assets minus current liabilities, but what we're going to do is we're going to take out cash and marketable securities. I mean, think about this. General Mills, I mean, it can do whatever it wants with its cash. And suppose that it, it takes some of its cash and it invests in Apple stock and Amazon stock. There's a marketable security. Well, does their investment in Amazon, does that have anything to do with that first little cycle that I presented you in that first slide? And the answer is probably no. So networking capital, we're going to exclude some stuff on the left-hand side and exclude some stuff on the right-hand side. Let's go ahead and work through an example here. We've got total assets. We've got some total liabilities. So we could back into equity, but we don't need to worry about equity here on this, con this component. So calculate total working capital and net working capital. Well, this is super simple math. I mean, all you really need to do is keep track of everything there on the, well, the top portion here, that would be the top left-hand side. And notice there's PPE, property, plant, and equipment. That's long-term, so we're not doing any of that stuff. Don't forget to include prepaid expenses. That's a short-term that's a short term asset. So you sum the current assets, you get 2250. You sum the current liabilities, you get 1880. So there's, uh, there's total working capital of, of 370. And then net working capital, we're going to go ahead and start with the 2250 and the 1880, and then we're going to take out the cash. There's the 150. We're going to take out the marketable securities. There's the uh, there's the 400. And then for the short-term liabilities, we're going to take out the 1200 in short-term debt. So if you subtract all those here, let me just go back here real quick. So we're excluding cash and marketable securities, excluding short-term and current debt. So you get, uh, well, what is that? A 1020. So here's my advice. Make certain that on the exam that you answer the question that the Institute asks. Clearly, if they ask for total working capital, you give them 370. If they ask for net working capital, you give them 1020. Make sure you, you answer the question that is asked. My students love answering questions that they prefer to show up on an exam. All right, what did I say earlier? This concept of liquidity, this is going to be an important word. Quick definition for liquidity, how quickly we can turn our short-term assets into cash. And the idea is not that we want to hoard cash, but we need cash to meet our short-term obligations. So this brings this concept of liquidity, this brings the specter of solvency and insolvency that I described, what was that, 15 or 20 minutes ago. So think about this cash conversion cycle. Think about networking capital and think about total working capital. What are we trying to do here? We're trying to be certain that we invest in short-term assets that are liquid enough. In other words, can we turn our accounts receivable over into cash? Can we turn our inventory over into cash so that we can pay all those people, all those businesses on that side of the supply chain? Now look at the orange, uh, the orange circle point there. Liquidity management. This is a great sentence to memorize. Company's ability to generate cash whenever it needs to meet its short-term obligations. All right, General Mills. This is 
a company that's been around for 10,000 years, right? It's been selling Count Chocula to people like me for a long, long time. So General Mills knows that when it puts Count Chocula on the shelf, it's going to be able to sell it, right? Generate cash whenever it needs. Now, look, we're going to have tremendous conversations about the goals of the business. The goal of the business is always to maximize the value to the owners of the business. Well, what does that mean? That means that we need to have efficient liquidity management. All right, how about sources of liquidity? There are primary sources of, of liquidity, which we've talked about cash from operations, right? And secondary sources of liquidity. All right, so let's do this. Primary sources, right? Cash and marketable securities on hand. What did I say? General Mills could easily sell its Apple stock and its Amazon stock to meet its short term obligations, but it probably doesn't want to do that. That cash is just cash that's been around. So let me go ahead and link the two financial statements. We got the, the balance sheet and the income statement. So at the bottom of the income statement, hopefully we'll have a bottom right-hand balance. We'll call that net income. Remember that net income swings back to the equity portion of the balance sheet. The goal of the business is to have the equity portion of the balance sheet to swell like a balloon. Now inside of that, even though net income being moved over to equity, that's an accounting kind of a framework, somewhere in there is going to be cash. So that cash then shows up on the top left portion of the balance sheet. So think about that cash and marketable securities on hand as the cash historically generated from our business operations that has yet to have been spent. Think of it, I don't want you to call it excess cash. Uh, I don't want to call it free cash flow because we have different names for that as we move through. All right, so just regular old cash. Then we can borrow. We can do this in the short term and we can do it a number of different ways. Companies like General Mills, what they do is, of course, that they have a line of credit with banks. But these huge companies, they can issue commercial paper, short term securities that have a maturity of, let's say, 270 days. They do this all the time and they do this in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, the learning module doesn't really emphasize commercial paper here. It emphasizes short term investment portfolio, trade credit, bank lines of credit. So I would remember those. But but don't don't forget commercial paper inside of that. And then down below at the bottom, this is the cash flow generated from the ongoing sales of current inventory of those Count Chocula boxes. Now, a couple of interesting things here about how we can look at these primary sources of liquidity and how we can convert. Now, be very careful here. What did I say just a moment ago? There's that net income on the bottom right hand portion of the income statement. How can we convert this cash conversion cycle, the accountant's way of keeping track of our business operations into something that is cash related. So look at the bottom of the purple box down there. What we're going to do, and we're just going to start this now, and we're going to emphasize this in throughout level one, two, and three. This is called cash flow from operations. Look at the bottom box there. Measures and issuers, primary business activities, cash profit over time calculate it as follows. All right, so this is cash received from customers plus any interest in dividends minus cash paid out minus the taxes minus any interest. So notice this cash flow from operations includes all the stuff, all the stuff that we do as General Mills selling, selling Count Chocula. Now, this is a huge difference between operating cash flow or cash flow from operations and this concept of free cash flow. This is the first time that we have heard this word. You're going to hear free cash flow multiple times, hundreds of times if you watch my level two and level three videos. But are you ready for this? I'm going to give you a definition of free cash flow. But first, I'm going to go back here and give you a different definition for cash flow from operations. This is Jim's def definition, but I think this will give you a good base understanding. Operating cash flow or cash flow from operations is the amount of cash remaining after all expenses have been paid. Now, think about all that stuff in the purple. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say free cash flow is the amount of cash remaining after all expenses have been paid, which is what I just gave you, right? Minus 
minus the investment in long-term assets. So let me repeat this. Free cash flow is the amount of cash remaining after all expenses have been paid and all investments have been made. So free cash flow is the amount of cash that's available and the executives have nothing to do with it. It's just sitting there. It's not free. It's not like someone just came and piled it up there and said, you hit the lottery, there's free cash flow. No, it's free because the executives, well, they don't have anything to do with it. They've invested in all the short-term stuff. They've invested in all the long-term stuff. Free cash flow. Now we're gonna learn this as we go along. These successful companies like General Mills, they have tons of free cash flow. What do they end up doing with it? Well, this is a, this is a big point of research in the academic world. Firms with lots of free cash flow, they tend to, they tend to have greater agency conflicts and they tend to pursue acquisitions that are wealth decreasing. But that's a conversation for another day. But you can see how excited I get about these conversations and uh, I can't help but tell you these things. All right, secondary sources of liquidity. Uh, this is what I was saying to you about the commercial paper, right? Secondary sources, we can do this kind of stuff, but we can renegotiate debt contracts. We can sell assets. Oh my gosh, we really don't want to do that. We can reduce or suspend dividends. We certainly don't want to do that. Issuing equity, filing for bankruptcy. So these secondary sources of liquidity are probably not very appealing, especially in the context of maximizing shareholder wealth. If we're hitting these secondary sources of liquidity, it means that we're doing something poor back in our capital budgeting decisions or capital structure decisions or any of those kinds of other decisions. Now look at the green box. So this is a great exam question. So the Institute could give you this question stem and say something like, hey, the firm is going to pursue a secondary source of liquidity. What are the consequences? And this is what you should automatically think. What does it tell us on the slide? Impact the company's financial and operating positions. So think long-term bonds, shares of equity. Those are part of the blue box up there. And then down at the bottom in purple, financial health is worsening. I mean, if we're declaring bankruptcy, then we're pretty much giving up, right? Now, of course, we can emerge from bankruptcy successfully, and that's, that's still a good thing. You guys know that I am going to send you to the questions at the end of this learning module. And once again, there are only five of them, but there's one question in there on the drags and pools on liquidity. What are some of these drags? And this, I'm gonna give away this answer here. Uncollectible receivables, inventory that's obsolete. And let me just pause and say, you know what? If that box of Count Chocula was made five years ago, I'd still buy it if it was the last box of Count Chocula. And I would come home and I would still eat it. And my mother would say, that has passed the expiration date. And I would say, oh, mom, those marshmallows. Oh my gosh, it's just, who cares when it was made? All right, so obsolete inventory, borrowing constraints. But how about the pool on liquidity? You know, this is in the other direction. What do we have in bold up there? Paid too early. So early payments, reduced credit limits, low liquidity positions. That should make perfect sense. So let's uh, remind ourselves what we learned in financial accounting in our undergraduate days and what we talked about in a previous learning module. How do we measure liquidity? How do we evaluate liquidity? Well, as good financial analysts, we're going to uh, perform some kind of an evaluation where we throw a new, uh, number in a numerator, throw a number in a denominator. We love ratios as financial analysts. We could just, we could live, we could live in a world of ratios. All right, so let's go ahead and look at these liquidity ratios here. These are super easy. You probably need to memorize these. Although, uh, you know, if the Institute asks you to calculate current ratio, I mean, this is so easy, current assets over current liabilities. Let me give you the, the accountant's definition of insolvency is a current ratio that's less than one, where your current assets are less than your current liabilities. Uh, how do we interpret it? I think this is the, the most fair question uh, on the exam. Remember, you have lots and lots of really difficult things to compute, not only in level one, wait till you get to level two and then level three. So I think the Institute probably views itself in that same manner that, you know what, I'm not going to insult or I'm not going to give away an answer. You know, I can't imagine that the Institute says, 
here's current here's uh, here's current assets 200 here's current liabilities 100 calculate the current ratio and you say two over one is two but i think the better question is how do we interpret this ah so how how remember we're this cash conversion cycle what does that tell us the current ratio is the primary ratio to tell us whether or not we're solvent that should make perfect sense but then we want to be a little bit more subtle and sophisticated. So in the numerator, let's go ahead and leave out inventory. So let's just do cash, short-term investments, and receivables. We'll call that the quick ratio. And then let's go ahead and leave out receivables. Let's just do cash and short-term investments. This is the cash ratio. So you can see that these are commonly used liquidity ratios. They each tell us something, something about liquidity, but there are subtle differences in the numerator. And as you memorize these equations, you ought to be able to apply the interpretation. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate these ratios super quick. Here we go. This was a previous balance sheet, right? Company ABC. This is just incredibly easy. We're hoping, we're hoping the Institute says, hey, current, quick, cash ratio. Those are three different questions. You know, you're allotted, what are you allotted? Nine minutes for those questions. I mean, you can do this in uh, how quickly does it take you uh, to do this? That's a minute, let's say. So now you have more time to work on, work on other questions. What have you heard me say multiple times? What's the goal of the business? Maximize the value of the firm. There are lots and lots of ways to do this. We've talked about this in other learning modules. One way is to uh, invest in product lines that have sustainable cash flows. One way is to issue the optimal amount of debt. One way is to pay the optimal amount of dividends. But remember, our focus here now is on the top portion of the balance sheet. So how do we maximize the value of the firm in terms of this cash conversion cycle, working capital management and liquidity management? So there we have in the very first uh, arrow point, maximize the value of the firm by making, it, by making certain that there is access to capital. So what does that mean? Access to capital means, all right, we're generating cash from our operations, but if we have, if we're low on cash from operations, that we can find somewhere else to lend us some money. Now, maybe that's an explicit bank loan, but maybe it's an extension of the terms of the credit to those organizations and businesses on that side of the supply chain. So look at the uh, colored bullet points that we have. Reducing the cash conversion cycle, uh, gauging liquidity re requirements, reducing surplus funds. You know, there's a concept that we, we haven't talked about. So surplus means that we have, you know, this excess capital. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that if we don't have have to rely on those external sources as much. You know, look down at the bottom purple there. This is important. Approximate working capital requirements based on revenue. I mean, think of a company like General Mills. What's what's their revenue? I mean, you know, it's some huge amount. But if I'm like, if I'm a company like, you know, Jim's Chocolate Cereal Company, my revenues might be this this high. So the difference in working capital management and liquidity management for those two firms based on the magnitude of the revenues is, is probably way different. Now there's a section in here in the learning module that I'm a little curious about. This sounds an awful lot like a managerial accounting class. And I'm going to go ahead and say this. Uh, of the five questions at the end of the learning module, none of them, none of them ask you about the difference between permanent and variable con, uh, current assets. But I'm going to go ahead and make sure that you can answer this question, because remember, every LOS is a potential exam question. So think of the exception to the permanent current assets as those that are variable, and we have this in bolded there, required at peak production or required at peak sales or the firm is in a growth phase. So this links the business cycle back to economic growth, whether that's the entire economy or just the microeconomic growth inside of our particular business. So I think it's important to remember variable current assets, they're variable with uh, peak production. I think these are really good exam questions. So we can have a conservative approach 
to working capital management. We can have an aggressive approach to working capital management, or we can have a moderate approach to working capital management. So my advice is to get out your phone here and uh, take some pictures. So what is a conservative approach? You probably don't need me to explain this. Conservative approach would mean always to have a bunch of cash on hand. You know, I have a cousin uh, who, he's a cash guy, and he always has several hundreds of dollars in his pocket. He's always had that, and I always ask him, I say, dude, why are you doing that? And he goes, I don't know, I just feel comfortable having the cash. And uh, this is, of course, a conservative approach lots and lots of cash. So look, higher proportion of inventory, cash, and receivables relative to the stuff that's going on on the right-hand side of the balance sheet or even over on the income statement. Now, the problem with uh, the conservative approach is that you're gonna have lots and lots of opportunity costs, right? If you have lots of inventory, if you have lots of receivables, if you have lots of cash, what's the return on those current assets? Well, I could argue that the return is essentially zero, maybe even negative, all right? So that's why we have that uh, that second diamond point there. Ah, flexibility, but it's costlier, but it's common in that early stage growth to have this conservative approach. So here, I want you to take a picture of this, advantages and disadvantages of the conservative approach. So this is what I was saying earlier, higher interest rates, right? You might have to issue some long-term debt, opportunity costs, right? There's permanent financing, uh, business operations might be restricted, but there's lots and lots of advantages here. Uh, the, the biggest one is that you have a sense, uh, you have a sense of security. So what does that first one say? Permanent, stable, right? Costs of financing are known, working capital required to buy inventory is certain. So it's less risky, but it's costlier. Hmm. All right, how about aggressive? working capital approach. This would be like me. I don't ever have cash. I mean, I have cash. I have $20 bills in my wallet, but I keep my wallet in my car and I don't ever go anywhere with my wallet, but I have my debit card. So I don't have any cash. But now you could make the argument that having that debit card is exactly like having cash. And I guess it is. But the idea here is to limit that surplus cash so that we're not losing out on the opportunity cost of not investing that cash, right? So that makes perfect sense. Now, what are some advantages and disadvantages? Go ahead and take a picture here. Um, yeah, what are the disadvantages, right? Higher short-term cash needs, right? So we may have to borrow and pay a higher interest rate, which brings in the specter of not only insolvency over the short term, but look what we have down in that third kind of a box, the threat of bankruptcy down there. And we might have to pay uh, different kinds of terms. Not only might we have to pay a higher interest rate, but a supplier might say, oh, you know what, I'll give you a half percent discount instead of a two or three percent discount. And you have to pay within two days, but I want you to pay me within five days, right? Pricier terms of credit. So why do we do this? But there are some there are some advantages. I mean, there's no doubt that interest expenses are lower because we don't have to do all that stuff on the right-hand side. Fewer restrictions on those business opportunities because there's, no, there's less debt on there and uh, low financing cost. All right, so what about this moderate working capital approach? Well, do you have to take a picture of this next one? Yeah, go ahead and take a picture of this. And so what we're doing is we're trying to balance the aggressive and the conservative uh, approaches here. And so uh, my guess is, and I don't know this from a research standpoint, but my guess is that most firms, you know, try to hover around this moderate approach. Although these large corporations like General Mills and Procter & Gamble, they're so big that they have such tremendous terms for their credit. They have such tremendous opportunity to um, tap into their lines of credit with bankers, but they also have the ability to issue hundreds of millions of dollars in commercial paper. This is what I was, uh, this is what I was talking about. So look at what we have down that third thing there, diversified sources of funding. That's what I was talking about. All right, let's try to wrap this up here. Liquidity and short-term funding. You know, what are we trying to do? We love this idea of flexibility. We love this idea of paying a low interest rate. We love this idea of having cash being generated when it is needed. 
All right, so how do we do this? How can we put together some kind of a slide that would summarize the conversations that we've been having? So we've done this for you in that green box. We want to ensure that we have enough source of credit and a diversified source of credit, right? We don't want to have to always go over there to Jim's bank because Jim might be failing someday. So we want to make sure we have Jim's bank and we have Bonnie's bank and we have these different suppliers. We have different people on the supply chain and we have commercial paper, right? Sufficient financing capability. And then we don't want to forget that we need to link not only our long-term strategy, which is a conversation for another day, but our short-term financing strategy here with capital market scenarios and economic conditions, right? Is the economy expanding? Is the economy contracting? Capital market scenarios. What are uh, our competitors doing? Are our competitors, are they squeezing liquidity? Or are they expanding liquidity? And we need to make sure that we differentiate between implicit and explicit costs. So here's a, a, a good uh, slide. Take a picture of this here. Factors that will influence a company's short-term borrowing. All right, so bigger the company, right? Bigger the credit, the, the greater the credit worth, worthiness, the more streamlined uh, the legal considerations, and then the fewer regulatory requirements, and then the nature of our assets, whether it's a chocolate uh, cereal making machine or calculator making machine, whatever it is, you know, so those things there will be those important factors that will determine whether or not we have access to those capital markets. So what did I say at the very beginning here? We we're going to work, learn about cash conversion. We we're going to learn about liquidity. And we we're going to learn about working capital. So those are the three important terms that you need to define. So go ahead and look at those five problems at the end of the learning module. I'm going to go ahead and say, I bet you can get those done in less than 10 minutes based on our conversation today. So thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.